Praise the Lord. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, it is written, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We that are the beloved brethren, we that are born again, we that are children of God, the Bible commands us to be steadfast. The Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And we that are born again are not to be double-minded. We're not to be wavering in the faith. We're to be steadfast, unmovable. How is it that we, the beloved brethren, can be unmovable? Psalm 125, verse 1, it is written, in the book of Psalm 125, verse 1, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. By trusting in the Lord, we can be as Mount Zion, which shall not be removed, but abideth forever. As it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable. By trusting in the Lord, we shall not be moved, but abide forever like Mount Zion, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We are steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because we have this promise from God's word. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And this is why the apostle writes in the book of Philippians chapter 4. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, the apostle writes under the inspiration of the ghost. Verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Even when we're abased, the apostle gives us an example of still serving the Lord. How many professing Christians, if there's no money involved, they give up in their service of the Lord? Many years ago, over 15 years ago, I was invited to a Bible study here in Bangkok, Thailand. Now at the time, I did not want to attend this Bible study, but the brother that invited me, out of respect for him, I went with him to this Bible study. And in this Bible study, they had invited a missionary from America who was part of a big name church here in Bangkok, Thailand. And at this Bible study, the question was asked to him of the greatest tribulation he went through in his quote unquote service to the Lord as a missionary. And he talked about a time that he did not know if it was God's will for him to be a missionary Tyler or not. So he made a, a vow to God. He put out a fleece that if 26 churches supported him, he would stay here in Thailand. That was his biggest tribulation. That was his biggest trial. His fear was to serve the Lord without 26 support churches. Needless to say, after I rebuked such a one, I left that quote-unquote Bible study never to return to such a thing again, to such a group as that. No, the apostle, the apostle Paul leads us an example in the book of Philippians chapter 4 that he served the Lord even when he was abased, even when there was no money involved. He served the Lord even in hunger. 
when he had to suffer hunger for the service of the Lord, he continued to serve the Lord. And why would he do such a thing and serve in the Lord even when he was a base and serve in the Lord even when he suffered hunger? Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle, writing under the inspiration of the ghost, writes of the many tribulations he went through in his service to the Lord. In verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, and labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. The apostle suffered so many stripes that were laid upon him in his service to the Lord, yet he did not give up, yet he continued to serve the Lord. Why would he do such a thing when he received so many stripes that it was above measure that you couldn't even number them? Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. In prisons, more frequent. The apostle frequently went to prison for the service of the Lord, yet he did not give up Yet he continued to serve the Lord, even frequently being arrested, even frequently being in prison. And why would he not give up? Why would he continue to serve the Lord, even and frequently being in prison? Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. In death oft, yes, the apostle, he wrote these words under this race of the ghost, for me the live is Christ, to die is gain. Before the apostles suffered martyrdom, as history teaches us, as he suffered on the Emperor Nero and was beheaded for the gospel's sake, even before that, there are many who try to take his life, and many of times he faced deaths oft. He faced death often. Yet even with death knocking at the door, even knowing he would eventually have laid on this life for the Lord's sake, he did not give up his service to the Lord. And why not? Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. That is a lot of stripes to receive from his own brethren, from his own countrymen, the Jews all for serving the Lord, all for preaching the gospel. And even though from his own brethren, from his own countrymen, he received 39, 40 stripes save one, five different times, he continued to serve the Lord. He did not give up. He did not get discouraged. He continued in the work of the Lord. And why is that? Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thrice was I beaten with rods, yet he continued to serve the Lord. Once was I stoned, and we can read about in the book of Acts, when they stoned him to death, carried his body outside the city as dead. Yet when he was revived, he continued his service to the Lord without giving up, without being discouraged, because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Yet despite all of those things, the apostles suffered for the gospel's sake, he continued to serve the Lord. And after going through so much serving the Lord and going through so much trials and tribulations, why would he do such a thing? 
because we have this promise from God's Word and the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 15 verse uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast unmovable always abounding the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We're not to be abounding in money. We're not to be abounding in cars or lands. We're to be abounding in the work of the Lord. We're to be rich in our service to the Lord. And why would we be abounding in the work of the Lord? Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. If we truly labor in the Lord, we shall be fruitful. The Lord Jesus Christ gives to us a promise in John chapter 15. In the book of John chapter 15 verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. We can be fruitful in the work of the Lord. We can produce fruits, and herein is God the Father glorified when we're fruitful. And how can we be fruitful? By abiding in Christ and His words abiding us, and we can ask what we will, and it shall be done unto us. We can be fruitful in the work of the Lord because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Many times as I obey the Lord Jesus Christ who commands us to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, I meet many professing Christians from all over the world who will question the preaching of the gospel. And they'll ask a question, does it work? Do people get saved? And my answer to them is, I have days and days of testimonies. Not hours of testimonies, days of testimonies to tell. Because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. When we abide in Christ and His words abide in us, and we ask what we will, and it should be done unto us, we can be fruitful in the Lord. And herein is God the Father glorified. Herein are we the disciples of Christ when we're fruitful in the Lord. For Jesus Christ says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. When a Christian is sanctified, as it is written, In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. A Christian that is sanctified is meet for the master's use. A Christian that is sanctified is prepared unto every good work. When we abide in Christ and His words abide in us, for Christ sanctifies us by His word, through the washing of the water of His word, that may be sanctified. When we're sanctified, we're meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work, and fruitful in the Lord. As is promised in the first Psalm, Psalm 1. God has given to us this promise for our labor in the Lord in Psalm, the first Psalm, verse 3. And he, he that delights in the law of the Lord, he that meditates in his law day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Herein is God the Father glorified, 
that we bear much fruit, that we prosper in the work of the Lord. And when we're sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work, abounding in the work of the Lord, our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We shall produce fruit, and herein is God the Father glorified. This past Friday evening, as I was preaching the gospel on the banks of the Chalpia River, under the Saban Daksin Bridge, here in Bangkok, Thailand, it was very hot, as we've now entered the hot season, and it's a very hot, hot season this year, here in Bangkok, Thailand. And as I preached the gospel, I preached myself out. We had prepared to go to Pat Perong Road afterwards, after sunset, and during the sunset, I preached from under the Saban Daksin Bridge, but I had preached myself completely out in this hot tropical heat during the hot season. When I finished preaching the gospel, my wife was ministering to a Thai woman who belongs to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is a cult which teaches false doctrine that err in the doctrine of Christ. As the Seventh-day Adventist was drawn to us preaching the gospel. You see, she confessed to my wife at her workplace she knows many Thai professing Christians, but she's never witnessed Christians preaching the gospel before. The church she belongs to, the Seventh-day Adventist church, they hand out literature, which is more than most professing Christians even do, but they do not preach the gospel. And because she witnessed us preaching the gospel, as Jesus Christ says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel of a creature, she was drawn to us and drawn to my wife who dressed as a godly woman. For the New Testament teaches us how to dress in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 9. In like manner also the women adorn themselves with modest apparel. And there she witnessed my wife with modest apparel, a cape dress that covered her body, which is as modest of apparel as you can get today with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair. Now my wife has a head covering on as the Bible commands us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for a godly woman, or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. And the Seventh-day Adventist woman witnessed my wife in subjection to her husband with a head covering on and serving her husband as her serve husband preached the gospel. This is what drew her to my wife as she saw we were living epistles. As the Bible says, we're living epistles read of all men, letting our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And at that my wife was able to give our testimony to the Seventh-day Adventist woman, which brought her to tears. Because she's never heard a born-again testimony before. The church she belongs to, they try to keep the Old Testament law, especially the Sabbath day, which God commanded the children of Israel in the Old Testament. But they do not have God's Spirit they're not born again. They do not have this testimony that in Christ they're new creatures, though it is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all things are become new. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And as my wife gave our testimony, how Christ Jesus saved us from our sins, how we were born again, how we became new creatures in Christ. She shed tears, never hearing such a thing. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is a cult, 
they boast themselves in their dietary laws that they keep. You see, they're vegetarians. And here in Thailand, amongst the professing Christians, they eat blood. Though we're committed not to in the New Testament, as it is written in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and verse 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. These are necessary things to Christians that the apostles gave to Christians and was good even to the Holy Ghost. That she abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye you keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. However, amongst the professing Christians here in Thailand, the majority of them eat blood. And the Seventh-day Adventist church, which is a cult, they'll use that against the churches in Thailand. They'll use it against Christianity by saying, look at these professing Christians, they eat blood, and then they'll boast their own church, which is big into their dietary laws of vegetarianism. And they use that against the church. So as this Seventh-day Adventist woman was drawn to the preach of the gospel, never before witnessing the preaching the gospel in the streets of Bangkok, Thailand, though the Lord Jesus Christ commands us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, as she was drawn to my wife, who was dressed as the Bible commands, the New Testament commands, a godly woman's dress, at modest apparel, even with a head covering on, in subjection to her husband, who was preaching the gospel, she asked my wife about eating blood. Because this is what her church, the Seventh-day Event, the church which is a cult, uses against Christians in Thailand. So my wife answered her, no, we don't eat blood. We believe in the New Testament. This was the first time she had heard such a thing. She even confessed to my wife. She knew many professing Christians at her workplace. She has many friends that are professing Christians, yet they always eat blood. And when she has brought this up to them before in the past, they've even argued and debated about it, defending the reason why they could eat blood. Though the New Testament commands us not to do so, that is a necessary thing, as necessary as it is to abstain from fornication, it is as necessary to abstain from eating blood because of a false translation in the Bible in the Thai tongue, a corruption of God's word, they believe they can eat blood. In the book of 1 Timothy, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, it is written in verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. Of course, this is creature. This is talking about animals, and every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. But in the Thai tongue, they translate the word creature to things, that everything is good. You see, blood is not a creature, but blood is a thing. And because of a false translation in the Thai Bible, Thai Christians believe they can eat blood based in it, on this corruption of God's word in their own tongue. False teaching leads to false practices. Corruptions in God's word leads to false teachings, which leads to false practices. We must stick with God's word, for God hath magnified his word above all his name, and God has preserved his pure words for us in a pure language today, in the authorized version of the Holy Bible, in the English tongue. And in the languages such as Thai, in their Thai Bible, they have an error, which leads to false practices of eating blood. Now does eating blood damn your soul to hell? 
though the Apostle says it's a necessary thing to the Holy Ghost, what it does do, it pushes Seventh-day Adventists away from the Gospel of Christ. But because we're without reproach, because my wife was able to answer that we don't eat blood, we believe the New Testament, this was a first for her. And she sat down and continued to listen to my wife preaching the gospel to her. Because my wife was now busy with the Seventh-day Adventist ministering to her, I had preached myself out. I thought at first I was not going to continue to Pat Pong Road that evening. I was physically worn out in this hot tropical heat here in the hot season of Thailand. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. But as my wife was ministering to the Seventh-day Adventist woman, I grabbed a bunch of gospel tracts and may have given them out to the people who were drawn to the preaching of the gospel. And as I was giving out gospel tracts, a young woman came up to me, took a tract from me, and professed that she was a Christian. I said, praise the Lord, a Thai woman. I said in the Thai tongue, praise the Lord. And then she confessed to me that she's witnessed me preaching the gospel to Pat Pong Road for many years. And because of that, she is now a Christian. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. If we're abounding in the work of the Lord, if we abide in Christ and his words abide in us, we can ask what we will and it should be done unto us. And we ask for souls. We ask that our labor in the Lord be not in vain. For God is willing for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We preach the gospel from God's word as God has promised that his word shall not return back to him void, but accomplish that which he pleases and prosper in the thing where to he sent it. And as we're faithful and abounding in the work of the Lord, our labor is not in vain. Souls get saved. When this woman professed to me that she's now a Christian, that she's witnessed me preaching the gospel many times at Pat Pong Road. This revived me, this encouraged me, and that evening, this past Friday evening, we continued on to Pat Pong Road to preach the gospel. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're fruitful in the Lord, and herein is God our Father glorified that we bear much fruit. Jesus Christ says, wherefore by the fruits ye shall know them. Are you a Christian? Do you serve the Lord? Are you bearing fruit? Are you fruitful in the Lord? Is God glorified because you're fruitful? Do you have fruit to offer unto the Lord? Is he glorified in your life? Are you saved? Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Does the Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? If not, repent ye and believe the gospel. For Jesus Christ says, ye must be born again. God bless you. We're praying for you. We're praying for you to be born again. Pray that you be a child of God, to be abounding in the work of the Lord, to be fruitful in the Lord, that God may be glorified in you. God bless you.